So we were going to do a comparison of two great proto-Renaissance masters, Cimabue and Giotto, and compare them by looking at two paintings of the Madonna and Throne, so exactly the same subject. These are both in the Uffizi in Florence, but originally, of course, there were altar paintings, panels, which are very large. In fact, the, the Cimabue is... Uh, More than 12 it? feet. Yeah, it's 12 feet tall. It's huge. And that was so that it could be seen the full distance of the church nave. And the Giotto, too, is more than 10 feet high. The Cimabue is a little earlier, and Cimabue is the very first artist that Vasari talks about at the very beginning of this incredible tradition of right. Italian painting. So Cimabue is really seen to make this first step away from a medieval style toward a more human-focused Renaissance style. Yeah, and there's a lot of controversy and interest in terms of why the Renaissance has its roots at this particular moment, in mm -hmm. this particular place. I mean, why in Florence, and why right here at the end okay. of the 13th century? And mm -hmm. one of the theories that's been put forward is pressure that was being felt in the Byzantine Empire to the east by Islam, and some of the artists perhaps fleeing the great traditions of, of the east and coming to Italy, and perhaps prompting it to think beyond uh, the traditions of the medieval. The first thing to say is that this is just a really standard subject that we see all the time. Mary, the mother of Christ, holding the Christ child surrounded by angels and or saints and prophets, lots and lots of gold. These are tempera paintings on wooden panels. It's egg tempera, and it's using minerals that are suspended in that egg media. It's, it's good for little lines. It doesn't blend no. well. It, it dries quickly. And so there's a really linear aspect to this painting, which mm -hmm. may in some respects result yeah, from the, the tempera. tempera. This is gold that's been flattened out. It's right. a very, pounded, thin very thin gold leaf, and in fact, mm -hmm. even tooled. That is to say, patterns have been pounded in to make it even more interesting. And then it's been glued onto the wooden panel. So it's been burned and sometimes there's a kind of clay layer underneath, mm -hmm. which you can sometimes see a little reddish. But the gold itself is really meant as this ornamental reflective material that had a symbolic quality in that right. it was meant to reflect the light of heaven. And neither of these are set in any kind of earthly realm. The flat gold background indicates a kind of divine heavenly space for these figures to occupy. And that makes sense when you look at the Cimabue because the Madonna, for instance, she's so, I guess maybe because she's defined by line. If she stood mm -hmm. up, you know, she would be so tall. She would be very elongated and her drapery is defined by line primarily and not as much by modeling from light to dark, although a little bit. There are some distinct medieval or Byzantine elements that are still visible mm -hmm. here. Her fingers are very long, her mouth is very small, the yeah. nose is very long. A kind of symbolism of the body, not a representation of a real person so much as a representation of a kind of ideal heavenly form. The angels are all stacked kind of on top it's of It's a good thing another. they have wings, isn't it? Yes. Because <laughs> what are they standing on? I don't know, but we do begin to get some sense of the beginnings of an illusion of space. A little in bit. Chimavui. She's got a little modeling under her chin. Mm -hmm. And you're right, the, the throne on which she sits does sort of recede. Except here's the funny thing. When you look at the throne carefully, it looks as if we're looking across at the Virgin Mary, but we're looking down mm -hmm. at the seat on which she's seated. Yeah. And, and in some ways, we're also looking up at her. There's not a single perspective of a point in which the viewer is situated. We have sort of multiple viewpoints. And that's something that, of course, will disappear more than a century later when we get to Brunelleschi in the early Renaissance. But I'm not comfortable with the idea that Cimabue couldn't do it. No. Yeah. So what about the four figures underneath? It's interesting that they're behind there. It does show some illusion of, it does. of it space. Does. And it kind of frames them as well. It does. And they're adorable down there, those prophets. <laughs> you can always tell the prophets because they're holding scrolls. Okay, so these are Old Testament prophets. Right, who would have predicted the coming of a Messiah, okay. of a Christ. And here, in the Catholic tradition, of course, that would have been understood as Christ, as exactly. you said. Right. Let's look over now at the Giotto, because things have really changed. Madonna just looks so massive and bulky and look at how her hips and her thighs cover her, that and her knee projects forward right? yeah her breasts and, are and look knees. at how differently the drapery is indicated instead of by uh, these the gold tiny lines yeah. right we now have real modeling from light to dark to indicate her knees so and her lap and even how the drapery pulls across her chest and her breasts look at back at the chimabue now the madonna looks so thin almost as if she's a paper cutout mm -hmm. and the jato looks so substantial so yeah. solid it's also interesting if you compare the angels, because in the Cimabue, in the earlier painting, the angels are stacked up. They don't sort of respond to gravity. Mm -mm. And they're also all very similar. They're sort of an idealized face. But if you look at the angels in the Giotto rendering from, from a few decades later, actually what's really interesting is Giotto is willing to put the angels in back of each other, even obscuring their faces. And the way that they sort of seem to go back behind the throne is 
peeking his head through in the back there. And yeah, the prophet's aren't in some sort of impossible right. basement yeah. now. And look at how much more modeling is in her face and yeah. in her neck. Like. There's one aspect of the painting by Giotto that I think is really significant and really interesting. In the Giotto, there's a very particular single point that the viewer is looking at this from. If you look, for instance, at the steps moving up to the Virgin, you're looking down at the top of the step clearly. So right. you know your eyes above that, but you're also looking up at the ceiling of the throne. So you're looking, That's so true. you're, so you're somewhere in between. And in fact, you're looking down at the seat, but you'll notice that just where the prophet's chins are, that's where everything sort of is exactly horizontal. Mm -hmm. right. So that's the mm -hmm. line at which our height. That's and, true. and that makes sense because that would put us just below Christ, a nice humble position. There's a kind of left-right axis too, which is to say that I think we can see a little bit, a little more, bit more of, of, the right. of the right window. Mm -hmm. So I think we're facing Christ. This begins to situate the viewer. This is not linear perspective. It's this almost kind of a like, more awareness of the human presence in front of the painting. I think that's exactly right. You know, one of the things that I like to think about is how similar these two images are despite their differences yeah. and the ways in which the understanding of originality was so entirely different than in our own culture. Right, so this is not so much derivative in a negative sense as we might think. In fact, there was a real tradition of the ways that you represent these figures because these are holy figures. That makes sense, and also this is very universal. This mm -hmm. is something that right. makes sense. It's it, transcendent. It transcends time, it transcends space. Right, but even within that, Giotto is still creating this new image because obviously things are beginning to change in the yeah. early 1300s. But he must be responding to cultural changes. That is, putting an emphasis on the here and now and in on a the way human, right. that, that will, of course, blossom into the Renaissance. Exactly. <laughs>